Hello, I'm Richard Eastus. I'm the PI for the Gold Mission. I will be talking about the observations by what, in my slightly biased opinion, is the most important mission NASA has flown in the past decade. The uh, key points, I'll talk about a few of them here first. The mission is had a prime mission of two years. That ends in October. In early this month, in June 2020, we submitted a proposal for extended mission. The estimate's healthy. It's being closely monitored, more closely than we had in, initially, because we realized the gain was the source of some uncertainties, or changes in the gain throughout the day were sources of some uncertainties in the 1356 mission. We've been, since the beginning of the mission, for following a nominal daily schedule of observations and having some occasional campaigns. The status, the data processing is there, what's happened is there are very few gaps in the coverage. Typically, the last few months, we typically we have the data available within about a week and a half, at least that's the L1C. The L2 is usually like a week or two after that it's available. Briefly about the observations, since there may be some people in the audience who are unfamiliar with the mission. I'm sure everyone else remembers all these details. Uh, the disk scans are most of the observations. Most of the time is spent on disk scans. The night side is only partial disk scans, just to increase the signals to noise. Those are done in the latter part of the day, each day. Earlier in the day, there's full disk scans. They uh, are occasionally, they're at 30 minute cadence, but occasionally every 30 minutes, there's a period in there where a limb observation is done. It typically is a limb scan. Occasionally it's an occultation when there's a star near the horizon. Okay, now we get to the main event here. Let's do some science. Uh, the things in blue here are, I'll be discussing those. Some of the things in black, there are uh, papers in the special JGR section on gold. Uh, some of these other things, there are papers coming out that are in blue. There's uh, the O2 densities, there is a paper out on that, but I find it's really intriguing observations and I like to talk about it. The mesosphere thermosphere wave coupling, Quan has a talk about that, Cedar talk that's recorded, so you can catch that separately. So anyway, there's so, some nice results there also. Say so now the nighttime, uh, this is the piece that thing that was most striking initially. Uh, large scale changes are much more dramatic than I'd ever appreciated from looking at ground-based observations from one location throughout a day or from a LEO satellite, which makes a pass and cuts through the equatorial ionization region uh, every 90 minutes or so. We uh, scan, have the, do the partial disk scans near, the, near sunset, just after sunset. Initially at night, there are only one channel is used. It scans alternating north and south the latitudes. So that continues until late at night when both channels are used to do scan, do the disk scans, partial disk scans. So, and that can, those partial disk, those disk scans for both, by both channels continue for about an hour and a half each night. Uh, the region scanned is about 45 degrees of longitude near sunset. And so that, gives about five times each night a geographic location is observed. So you can observe both crests repeatedly throughout the night, when, at least when there are two. Occasionally there's only one. Now I'll just highlight here uh, one of the things that is coming out, some work that will be being done by Deepak, in JG, will be in JGR special issue. The uh, observations have been mapped into geomagnetic coordinates. 
you can see the bubbles, they stand out prominently here. And since they're re re observed on repeated scans, they can be tracked by, to the change in position, giving the velocity through change in longitude versus time. Some really, really nice results there. Some fabulous results. So it's really interesting to see that. Also, there's a recent paper by Joe Huba and Hanley Liu that used the SAMI and Wacom X models to do some modeling of the bubbles, and that's in GRL. That's just recently out. All right, now, the, of course, the geomagnetic storms, everybody's always wanting to look at those. There are lots of interesting things happen. It's 800 pound Corolla. Maybe it's only 700 pounds at solar minimum because even though there's no big storms, there's still significant changes from some the relatively, relatively small storms at solar minimum. The gold observes the T disk every day. So on the storm day, this is a relatively small storm in 2019. Temperature is shown here. And by taking the difference from the previous day, we can see how much the storm really changed the temperatures. And it's pretty dramatic how much change there is in the temperatures. It's also shown here is the, the composition. They have you know, this really dramatically different uh, structure and more focused structure than the temperature changes. So it's all very, uh, sort of being able to follow this is something we've never been able to do before. The data that I'm showing you here is uh, slightly different. It is different, it's, it's coming the, uh, on, to the lab website this summer, later. The TDS data is always, we always thought it was the most challenging of the measurements gold makes, at least as far as the requirements we had, we had it set up for ourselves with NASA. Uh, the uh, products identical to this will be out later this summer. There, the, the stuff has been, the data has been two by two before the retrievals. You don't get quite the same results if you sum up the two by two, by two the current stuff because there are other changes we also made to improve the data quality, to decrease the uncertainties. This uncertainties, statistical uncertainties in this, that stuff I'm showing you, at least for the temperatures, the T this temperatures is about 60K with a 30 minute cadence. In addition to the binning, some of the, well, the changes we made that really improves the data, uh, and decreases the uncertainties is in the temperature retrieval process. We've looked at that enough now that uh, we realize we can make some changes to how we're doing it. So what, the way we get the temperatures, the T dust temperatures, is we use fits to the N2 LBH emissions. We retrieve it by looking at for our best fit. Now there's seven vibrational levels in the LBH bands. And since the brightness of these can vary independently, we know that in the aurora that the populations, the relative populations, the amount of emission from each of these vibrational levels is different than it is in the day glow. Since we know that they can vary, we, we've had those as independent parameters. As we know that the pressure varies with altitude, that the pre as pressure varies with altitude, the emission varies with altitude, the, balance of emissions does. We just didn't have a confidence that the, initially anyway, that the, that we understood the populations well enough to set a value for those but without retrieving it. So we've been retrieving those. Um, part of the issue is shown here as the solar's and the interthangle changes, some of the larger solar's and interthangles, the altitude of the emissions going up because the sunlight the solar EUV is stopping higher in the atmosphere and that the pressure is lower there. The composition is different. So that it does make a difference in the emission. And you may have noticed it. I finally did myself and uh, was wondering about the, the variation with solar zenith angle, at least in ODIN2. It's not as apparent actually in the T-disc because it's certainly noisier, but in the ODIN2 it was noticeable 
had to scratch my head a little bit and finally realized that, oh yeah, it, you know, it was really, the mission's coming from higher altitude, so that, that makes sense. But it wasn't immediately apparent to me when I looked at it. In the first notice, this is subtle, but, but I finally caught on. Um, so anyway, this, uh, just to show you here how the populations look, you know, this is a theoretical curve here. Uh, I guess it's actually got the, the it doesn't have the, 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 uh, the dots on the theoretical curve there is without the dots, but the others have the dots. But they were getting consistent results. Sarov has been doing this. He's been done some nice work on this. So now it's clear that we can, by uh, fixing the parameters, we can use one parameter for the LBH bands rather than having to use seven. That decreases the number of parameters we have to use in that retrieval by about half, which makes a significant difference in the uncertainty, improvement in the certainty of the results. He's also been doing some stuff with the solar eclipse that occurred in 2019. These are really some unique measurements, really interesting measurements. Uh, the, uh, just for this dashed region here is the conjugate point to the solid region. So there's really uh, some interesting observations. It's a series of scans where we're able to watch how, as the eclipse goes across near sunset, where uh, later in the, this year, December, there's, there's actually an eclipse that goes through basically around noon. So it'd be even really better observations than what we are able to do here. We have a longer term and longer term uh, baseline to look at. So we will do, be looking at those also as a campaign. That's, but this, we're, this is a good warm up. This is really great to have this. But these are some really surprising observations the uh, stuff that's in the JGR paper that's under review is about the observations. Some of the analysis we've been doing more recently indicates that, oh, at least we, we find that we can't get the, the uh, models to show as much decrease as what we see. At least they don't want to give us that. So it's not clear why that's happening, but it's, it is a result that we're getting out of uh, some of the recent stuff. Okay. Now let's go to the occultations. These, uh, I find these, you know, they're simple observations, but they really tell an interesting story that, that even I can follow. Uh, you know, this, uh, the blue lines here show you where the occultations occur. It's one of these two, two curves since the satellite position is fixed, the position of the occultations is also. So what we have from the occultations then is we have altitude information and from each one. And by combining a bunch of them, we get some local time variation. You can look at that. So just looking at the altitude, um, you have the variation, of course, it's fit to data is the fit and that start out with an a priori, but the a priori doesn't really matter much. This is from the MSIS model, so what was used here. And systematically, Jerry found that he gets values in the range that are a bit lower by maybe 40, 50% than what the model would predict, the MSIS model would predict anyway. And in the 160, 170, 180 kilometer range, we're getting really good results. It's really in, basically, it's, it is in, independent of the a priori values. It's a self-calibrating, essentially a self-calibrating measurement in the sense that it's a relative measurement. So you just have to watch how the brightness changes as a function of time, which is how it really is a function of altitude through the atmosphere. So that's, that was uh, one of the first things we noticed. More recently, he's done more analysis. If you take a lot of these observations, you can look at the local time variation. And again, it's a bit of a surprise that we see it, uh, you know, it's sort of different. You know, you can see that the, there is an offset in the values here. These are on the same scale. So there's offset in the values, but there's also a difference in local time variation between these. So uh, it's more prominent in the observations than what 
the IMSIS model is given, which is, of course, an empirical model. And I guess it's not really a great surprise that, uh, that the observation or the model doesn't do, um, could be off at 160 kilometers, 170 kilometers. This is a, one of the first times that we've had something where we can really start tying this down. It's far, actually part of the problem <laughs> with these observations. Like, what do you compare against? Uh, there's not really any good observations down at those altitudes. Okay, let me just wrap up here to summarize that uh, things, are, things are going well. The observing is uh, data keeps coming every day, no gaps, almost no gaps, just maybe a little bit here and there. It's basically as merciless the pace is. So, you know, uh, you know certainly the, this, I'm glad that the uh, early 2021 that NASA has a dedicated GI program for ICON and gold. Certainly, uh, there's lots to do an analysis of this. The gold has been providing some, you know, certainly been surprising and ex exciting impact, uh, impactful observations and insights. And the combination of gold and ICON, I think, is going to be, it'll be far more powerful than what either is alone. Um, so, and if you want to learn more about these, and have the opportunity there is a grand challenge workshop that's being run virtually this year concert um, this is cedar grand challenge workshop so tune into that and just of course the have the link here for the special section and with that uh, thank you